George, I'm not sure, Tom, if you're there. I'm happy to take any questions or if anyone wants to share anything before the talk. So I definitely have tried what I feel like is my hardest to sit with the uncomfortability of not being able to sit with myself. Right, right. It hasn't gotten easier. This isn't, I wouldn't call myself a newbie, but I wouldn't call myself experienced either. My first time I learned about meditation was in 2008. Um, so consistency, I would say, has been a problem for all those years. I, I own that. Debbie, let me, if I may, just jump in for a second, because I know we're going to have to um, shift into the talk in, in a moment. Yeah. It, it, do you have a, a question here, or which is, or do you just want to share this? Well, I guess the question, because somebody wrote in the post, it takes practice or something. I can't remember what the words were. Yeah. So, or, and since Debbie was saying stuff too, I figure there may be other people who are struggling. And if there's right. an extra little nugget that you can share for those of us who are struggling. Right. Well, I can share that the, the willingness, the attention and the intention to sit with discomfort is central to the shift. Because when you think about how we're wired, we don't, we don't want to feel uncomfortable, right? I mean, we want to, in general, most people want to feel comfortable just about all the time. And sitting with ourselves can be downright uncomfortable. I can tell you as someone who was uh, around longtime meditators for decades, and I was a dabbler, you know, I go kind of in and out and not really committed to it. Uh, I don't know exactly how it happened, but I made a decision somehow, consciously or not, a decade ago, that I was going to be very consistent. And I've been consistent. Really, for the last decade, I've probably missed 15 days, maybe. You know, and what I found was that what was stopping me from being consistent was the intensity of my anxiety. You know, so when I would sit. I would become extremely aware of how anxious my body felt, you know, and so I just didn't want to, you know, it was painful, right? And so that's what led me to stop all so many times over the years. And something just shifted in me where I said, I'm going to sit with my anxiety, period. You know, I don't care how I feel, I'm going to sit. And I think that that, that makes a difference because as much as, we hear things like, you know, trust your feelings and, you know, do what you feel like doing. Sometimes that's not good advice. Sometimes the better advice is to really be willing to sit with discomfort. And also sometimes it means kind of getting up. It doesn't have to only be sitting meditation. I mean, you may need to move, you know, or do other things. I mean, it's, many of us have trauma, you know, in our past. And that trauma, you know, has worked its way deep into the body deep into the unconscious and it takes sometimes you know other measures to kind of intercede you know in that system i do think that you know as george brought up that theme of kindness in the very beginning sitting with having being kind to yourself practicing self-compassion even when it's not going well right or maybe in particular you know when it's not going well to just keep reminding yourself to bring kindness to yourself as an, and as an underlayment. Well, th thank you, Julie. I, I think Farah had a question. Here and I'm, I'm okay, Farah. We'll, we'll try to make this quick, and then I'm going to go into. You the know what you can do. Thank you so much. I appreciate uh, for everything. What you can do, I just pose a question, and you can maybe answer in the uh, on your talk. 
It doesn't need to be necessarily okay. for me. Uh, the question that I have, I think I put it on the chat as well, that I have been, uh, you know, noticing and practicing this uh, loving kindness meditation for about six, five years. Uh, but I still, uh, just like what Julie said or others said, I still cannot receive. And especially when you said, you know, be open to uh, accept that you deserve love. Right. I feel those resistance, right? And I try to sit with that resistance. I saw that my mind is going back and forth to different people because I'm so great with giving. But right. receiving is a big challenge, right? Right. And uh, I am so great with the uh, guided meditation. That guided meditation has helped me to reduce that resistance and go with the fluidity. Uh, but if mm -hmm. it comes with uh, quieting my own mind and receiving my own, it's a big struggle. So I, my question is, is there any way that, is that okay if I just, you know, just focusing on other people's guidance and go with the flow or... Do I have to sit and just, you know, be that? Um, that's my question. Yeah, well, I just, I'm a strong believer in doing whatever works. Okay. <laughs> uh, there are a lot of people who have great difficulty just sitting with their own, uh, their own being without some type of guidance. So I think it's perfectly fine to get guidance. I mean, the point is really to keep breathing and evolving, not to... Uh, necessarily hold to some some belief or some script because i'm so great with sitting with the pain and i've sitting with the pain for a while but i noticed it doesn't work because as you sit with the pain the pain is become more and more and you become more and more dig into it so it's just kind of becoming to that cycle that's what i'm right i don't know why i'm thinking about sodom and gomorrah right now but uh, <laughs> for some reason this association came up you know, of uh, turning and looking at. And sometimes it's important to turn and look away, mm -hmm. right? Okay. You know, it's, and it's, there's no one size fits all or always to do this or always to do that. I think part of what makes being human so complex and difficult is that there's no one right answer, right? You know, something could work one day and not the next day. You could wake up in a fantastic mood one day and not the next day or the next you know and so it's like how do you meet everything that shows up with some level of grace and kindness i mean for me that's been a big question you know in my life a guiding question all right so thank you very much okay so for those of you who are here last week i'm going to give a recap and for those of you who weren't here, I just want to say a few words about last week because it very much connects with what I'd like to be speaking with you about tonight. So last week I was really speaking about kind of relational acumen, you know, as someone who's been in a lot of different relationships. I'm not, when I say relationship, I'm not talking about necessarily a mate relationship. I'm talking about family, friends, colleagues, people on the street. I'm talking about other relationships in general. Okay. And so having had just an enormous amount of experience professionally working with people, leading groups, trainings, in, in personal environments and in, in organizations, I've come to really see three different areas as very significant. Now, there are other areas that are significant. So I'm not saying that these, these particular three areas are the only or the most. I'm just saying that for me, they have really stood out. And the first was being present being present with yourself and other people. And to be present, there takes an intention and attention. Because it's very easy to be distracted, thinking about other things, being on your iPhone. Distractions are the name of the game these days. And so it, it takes a certain mindset and focus. To, I'm going to focus on this person. I'm going to focus on myself. I'm going to focus on my breath. I'm going to focus on this person. And that focus is really part of the underlying intention. And, and part of that focus is really about appreciating, you know, looking for what you can appreciate in yourself and what you can appreciate in other people. Many people, when they, when they 
uh, sort of looking at self-appreciation, have all kinds of naysayer voices and say, no, not me, I don't deserve it. You know, I, I, I don't, I haven't done this, I haven't done that, but, but you know, they have all kinds of reasons not to acknowledge themselves. I, I know that actually very, very much personally, but I found nonetheless that the continual practice of that makes a difference. Because when you think about practice, practice is what leads to habits, right? And ultimately what we're talking about is our, our habits. And you think about the word habit, habit is the root of the word habitat, right? So our habits are where we live. You know, I, I, I would bet that if I could see someone's, like just a pattern of somebody's habits, you know, in general, habits of thought, habits of mind, habits of behavior, habits of body, you know a lot, you know, about that person. And so the, for most of us, we spend a good amount of our habits kind of beating up on ourselves. You know, like self-criticism is uh, rampant. I, I don't know if that's particularly new, but I do know that it is rampant and you can see it in, you know, the questions that come up and in the chats and, you know, it's sad and I, I totally get that because I, you know, I, I spent most of my life living in some degree of self-hatred, uh, much less so, you know, over the years, because you know, frankly, I, I practiced a lot of uh, doing these things about like literally going, what can I appreciate about myself? You know, and, and at first when I was doing this super awkward, like, come on, give me a break, right? But over time, I, I really started to get it. It wasn't about inflation. It wasn't about narcissism or ego. You know, it was about genuinely taking in the good. And when you think about Rick's Rick's work, which I'm very aligned with, and you know, I'm, I'm in that territory and, and a true believer, shall we say, it really takes a focus, right? And so appreciating self and showing and sharing appreciation to others. So George, I was heartened when you said before that you had reached out you know, some people and shared your kindness to them. And it makes a difference. It really makes a difference. And I, I really believe that we, we just need more of that. And so, and then the last area I spoke about was compassion because, you know, people suffer. We suffer, you know, when we are suffering, we, we need self-compassion and others are suffering. You know, they need our compassion and how to share that compassion and be open, open to that and not restrained. If you notice something in someone, you know, most of us tend to be pretty shy, like, like, I'm not going to say that, or how's a person going to respond to it? And I'm really encouraging you to really have the courage to express yourself, you know, kind of come out of your silo. You know, I, I sometimes see the world these days, like these silos out there, despite the billions of people like live in these silos. And, you know, I don't know that silos are the best way to be living, but that's a lot of what we, you know, we see on this planet. So underneath these themes, you know, presence, appreciation, and compassion, I believe, are the themes of giving and receiving, which is really the focus of the meditation. You know, how do you give, give to others? And how do you receive from others? Maya Angela, the great poet, said, when we cheerfully, when we give cheerfully and accept gratefully, everyone is blessed. And so, and I, I agree with that because I think that the willingness to give and the, really the willingness to receive itself is a blessing. And so I'm really seeing this whole giving and receiving as a complete circuit. And a lot of times what happens is that uh, it doesn't actually turn into a circuitry. You know, the, and there are various reasons why, you know, can, and so I, I've thought about this territory quite a lot, and some of you have already spoken to like I I can give, you know, but receiving mm, not so much, not so open to that. And you want to ask yourself like what, why, why would you not be open to receiving? Someone offers you something, they appreciate something that you've done or some way that you're being, and and no, it's no big deal. My experience is most people will just kind of, it's not a big deal. No, don't look at, okay. You know, it, it's as if the gift of someone's appreciation or acknowledgement is experienced as a threat. And you go like, huh, like, why would that be? 
I mean, why, why would why would what would happen that would get in the way of that kind of natural circuitry? And a lot of times it's suspicion, right? I mean, let's face it, many of us were quote given things with an expectation of return that there are you know the, the gift itself wasn't so pure or that there was some manipulation behind it or some some intent to to get something to garner something to you know not necessarily give it in the in the spirit of just total giving and openness but there's some ulterior motive to it and so I think some of us are, you know, suspicious of that, you know, understandably, you know, so, um, and the other side is that sometimes we've given gifts, you know, we try to offer something to someone and the person just wouldn't receive it, right? And how is that for you? Right? But the irony to me, you know, is that the person who is on the other side is, is being, you know, given the gift uh is, who's going no 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 uh, no 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 they're being very self-referential at that time they're not thinking necessarily about the person offering the gift and to offer a gift is actually vulnerable right like the person doesn't receive it so there's a there's a natural circuitry that i believe happens when someone offers a gift and the other person receives it because when they offering the gift when you offer a gift and the other person receives it well, that itself is a gift to you, isn't it? You know, and, and so there is something that's inherently vulnerable about both giving and receiving that makes it challenging. And, and I'm of the belief that we need to challenge ourselves, you know, that as much as it's vulnerable to give and to receive, you know, I don't wanna say it's the only show in town, you know exactly but it's a major show out here i don't mean show in the sense of like something that's you know fake or false or you know made for tv consumption i just mean that it's something that is very natural you know to being human you know a parent giving to a child and the child like happily receiving you know like if those of you who have pets you know who are who love love pets like you they're, they're not resistant to receiving generally like yeah you know give me more give me more give me more and so there's that's part of what for those of us who, who love pets what we love because it's so easy and natural and there's not the necessarily the risk of being rejected and so those risks of being rejected or even potentially being humiliated you know are really really big so i think about really this this whole theme of deserving you know when um um, beginning who that was I'm looking for your name who was just speaking about I, I can give but I, it's very hard for me to receive because many of us have really uh, developed the belief that we don't deserve you know that we, we're not deserving and I, I venture to say that that's more the rule than the exception I, mean, I think it's super sad that that's the case but a lot of a lot of the giving has felt you know somehow uh, something that we don't necessarily trust, right? And so there are there are these hesitancies to giving and to receiving. And so I, I think about some of the ones that people that I've heard use about why aren't they giving more? Why aren't they showing more? And one of them is like, I don't have enough time, which is interesting in and of itself because really how long does it take to show an appreciation or you know, they don't think they know the other person well enough, you know, or that the other person will, you know, not trust them if they show something, you know, or they don't know how to give, you know, how do I, how do I actually give something? And then there's, I don't believe I have anything to offer, you know, and so these are all tricks of the mind, you know, and so I, I think about my favorite bumper sticker, which is don't believe everything you think. You know, and so to really be aware of that prospect of how the mind just starts shooting out these these things, and it's very easy to believe they're true, right? You know, so for those of you who you know are sharing, I don't know how to, I really can't really receive. You know, the bottom line is I'm betting that 
there are this character or voices inside of you that are telling you don't deserve this or constantly batting it away like it's shielding it you know from yourself you don't deserve it who are you to who are you to take this in if you take this in you know something bad will happen you know th there's a term in uh, australia uh, called the tall poppy syndrome if you're australian you would you would know this and the idea of the tall poppy syndrome is that the tallest poppy is the first to get lopped off right? and so you don't want to stand out you don't want to stick out and if someone kind of acknowledges you to acknowledges you then you know you could be potentially threatened you know in that or maybe somebody else is going to be jealous and competitive are going to try and do something to you to knock you off your throne so to speak so it becomes very very complex and then there are you know those of us who feel resentful I feel like they haven't been given enough in life you know that life has given us too hard a lot and just are tired and don't want to give anything don't feel like you have any resources you know and are just you know have kind of like given up on, on some level and one of the things I think about giving up is that I know for me I have quote given up many times I've said screw it I'm out of here I mean I'm out of here I'm going to kill myself but I wouldn't mind uh, if I weren't here right and those times uh, dark though they be I've always come back from and so when, when I think about that question about enlightenment that Raj asked earlier today, is it like a set it steady state or is it, you know, moments there? I'm a moment guy. And to appreciate those moments and we can always keep coming back no matter how far, you know, we've fallen off. There's an opportunity to come back. And I think that part of that opportunity is really sitting with yourself, sitting and breathing and feeling and really practicing kindness. Now, the hesitancies for not receiving, you know, again, not deserving it. And sometimes for people that evokes guilt, like some people have grown up in families where they were the favored child, for example. And so they got some type of accolades, acknowledgements, and a, a sibling or other siblings hated them for it. You know, they didn't get the resources. And so that became a threat you know, getting, getting the goodies, you know, and so sometimes it's like, if I really let this in, this other person is going to have, have unrealistic expectations of me and what could go wrong from there, you know, so we have to really kind of look at how can we let in as much goodness, let in as much appreciation and compassion as we, as we can and really have that be a focus because there are really a lot of obstacles to this and I think that many of us shame ourselves we live in levels of shame that this should be so easy it should be so easy to meditate right I should be so easy to clear my mind it should be so easy to let go of self-judgment well it's not right it's not and to really kind of get that that this this is all part of the human condition so I think about you know some of Rick's works and which Rick's work and I'm uh, I'm in this camp as I mentioned before about taking in the good right and so there are so many opportunities in life and I'm sure Rick has spoken about this on many occasions where someone offers you something right they give you something they're extending themselves in some way and I think what's really important is to notice whatever reflexive reaction you have, which it might be to even poo-poo. And you, you may have learned enough in life to, to not outwardly reject it from the person, but inwardly, you may be defended against it. And so you may want to really be thinking about, how can I open myself up in this moment? So when someone offers something to me that I breathe it in, right? And so one of the movements that I like to do, and I didn't share this when we were meditating because most of you had your eyes closed, is when I think about exhaling, so I'm exhaling into the world, I'm giving something into the world, I'm entering the world. And as I'm inhaling, I'm taking in, I'm taking in. So it's exhaling and inhaling. And so sometimes those physical practices in addition to the, the sitting 
can make a big difference, particularly for those of us who are more kinetic. So really thinking about taking in the good and really you know, practicing giving yourself, giving yourself some appreciation, however vulnerable that feels. When you've done something that you feel even a little bit good about, and it doesn't have to be a big deal. I think a lot of times, many of us think it has to be like this huge gargantuan thing that would lead us to go, okay, now I can feel good about myself because I, I did this, I ran a marathon or whatever it happened to be. No, it's those little things, little movements, little intentions, little practices that over time really make a huge difference. So I'm gonna open it up uh, in, a, in a moment there. So I'd like, uh, I'm gonna ask you, those of you who would like to speak uh, with your video on, to really think about what, what question or questions do you have, or if there's something you wanna share, to share it as succinctly as possible, because there's probably a number of people who would like to share, and so we don't get into very long dialogues between us or long stories as you're sharing those. So with that, I'd like to open it up, and I see Lynn from Calgary. My question is this, um, a first reflection, and that is that I guess I've been around long enough and did enough sort of self-exploration. I'm a big fan of Rick Tarnas, by the way. <laughs> Love his work. Um, that I have this whole structure that I rely on and it keeps me from uh, receiving from other people because I do the poor me thing a lot. And so my question is this, um, does that make sense? That that's, I've got this whole structure that I work from and um, I want to let it go without self judgment. And how might I do that? Well, I mean, there's probably some payoff to feeling sorry. Oh, indeed. People feel sorry for you. Yeah. You right. get sympathy. Right. Oh, yeah. Right. You know, it's interesting that this is what you're talking about, I think, is Freud's. I probably don't hear about Freud much, you know, in this yeah. Freud's one of his greatest, I think, realizations. He called this secondary gain, you know, that how a, mm. how a symptom. Uh, is a secondary way of getting a primary need met. You know, and mm -hmm. so, for example, someone who is depressed, and I'm not saying everyone depressed, if this is true, but I'm just giving an example of this. Someone who's depressed somehow, someone comes, oh, you poor thing, how are you? And they start giving this person some care that they want, and but they're not getting it in a direct, in, the, in a kind of a direct way, will you love me just as I am? It's because they're defective in their mind or deficient, they need something. So they get this, you know, in response, you know, and so you may want to really look at that and, and the, really the underlying vulnerability of, of receiving directly, right? That you are lovable as you are, you are worthy as you are, and you don't need to be different. And I think that's one of the big challenges that most of us have is that we think that we need to somehow be different. We need to be perfect. We need to have it all together in order to be deserving. But uh, it turns out that that's a pretty long wait, you know, for most of us. And so I, I'm curious for you, and like, what would that be like to actually just open yourself to like- okay. I, I didn't experiment this morning, <laughs> aware of this. I had a dental appointment that I was supposed to be at and I woke up feeling really sick. Um, and my first thought was I'm going to I'm going to write them a note and I'm going to tell them how I've got problems with my rent and my sisters in the hospital and all these things but I just wrote and said I'm not feeling well. And they wrote back and said hope you're better call us when you are. Mm -hmm. And it was it was enough. And you are enough. <laughs> yeah, which, thank you. Which, which might be you know, a nice uh, mantra for yourself, probably not just for you, but for a bunch of people here. Thank you. You're quite welcome. <laughs> All right, George. Yeah, thank you, Daniel, for your wonderful talk. I just wanted to support what you said. Um, back at around 1990, I went to some retreats and 
they had said at that time were always already not listening. And <laughs> yeah, always already not listening. And that kind of, that was before cell phones and all these easier distractions. But I just wanted to support your talk that we are habitual and caught in our mind and habits and uh, just to support the awareness of that even before so many games and phones and all that. All right. I mean, it, it's quite something to intend to focus, right? Because a lot of times in life with our monkey mind and our wandering mind that gets distracted quite easily, it's hard to actually pay attention, right? And for those of us who have attention issues, you know, to begin with, it can be even more challenging. And at the same time, we do know that we can change our brains. I don't think there's any question about that these days. And so when you think about, if I decide I'm going to have this deep intention to really focus, it itself will make me focus. And one of the things I've found to be super useful in terms of that focus has to do with the questions we ask ourselves. You know, it's one thing to say, I'm going to focus in a, like a compulsive and kind of pushing yourself kind of way. It's another to say, hey, how can I focus now? How can I focus my attention on my breath? How can I focus my attention on this other person? And I, I oftentimes think of the question as the, you know, the root of the word question is quest, right? And so the questions we ask ourselves kind of, kind of promote us and kind of push us in a particular area or guide us you know, in a particular area. So um, thank you for that, George. I, I don't, I'm not noticing other hands up and I was thinking that given past experience, there were gonna be people who wanted to share something and also I'm gonna sit here and wait for someone. Yes, Lillian. It seems to me that um, one can engage intention gently, that it doesn't have to be, I'm going to not follow any of the distractions that come up. I'm going to resist them. I'm going to try, you know. That feels like so much work and it feels like yeah. um, from my background, it's like I, I have a deeply religious background and it's like, that's not the move of the Holy Spirit. That's like mustering up my own yeah. human willpower that does not have the the power it doesn't yeah yeah mustering yeah. a discipline and mustering up yeah. self-control did not work for me yeah i tried to bridle my sharp tongue yeah. but when i started practicing self-compassion right then compassion flowed so yeah. it's the same thing with intention and focus which yeah. is harder to practice than self-compassion <laughs> right Right. That's a really important point you're making. You know, and, and when you think about like garnering, pushing yourself, there's a way that that's kind of threat based, you know, that it can feel threatening internally and, and a part would naturally bridle against that. You know, and, and it also doesn't really work in terms of working, generally working with your mind. You know, like telling yourself not to experience something like don't I don't want to feel anxious or I don't want to feel depressed or I don't want to feel angry or I don't want to feel scared or whatever it happens to be that just doesn't work and the reasons why there is there's a, a psychologist named Daniel Wegner he was known for what he called the ironic processes and the basic idea is that in the mind 
there, there's an operating system, you know, and the operating system is attempting to fill the operations that a person is setting out. Like, so in this case, it might be like, I don't want to feel anxious, right? And, or I don't want to be uh, self-judgmental. -judge right? And so there's also a monitoring system that's monitoring the degree to which you're being successful with the operation. You know, and so in this case, the monitoring system is looking for times when you're actually being judgmental, you know, towards yourself to see if you're not being judgmental. You know, so ironically, it makes you more, it actually exacerbates it. And so it, a much better practice is just kind of letting go and noticing, right? Noticing when judgments come up without attaching to them and being able to, you know, look at those. And part of what's, you know, I think it's super challenging in terms of being human is a tendency to identify with our thoughts and to believe that they're true, you know? And so the more that we can actually see that thought and go take a breath and practice self-compassion, self, um, uh, you know, as you were saying, I think really the better. So I'm glad that that practice is working for you. I'm very confident it work for just about all of us. So thank you for that, Lillian. All right, so Julie. Um, I'm actually going to try to help Linda because she's having an audio problem and she just posted a question. Okay. It's in the chat. If you can look, it's the last chat. Her question is being present in my training was having a hundred percent of your attention on the other, like two lovers and having your full attention over there on the other, you disappear. And whenever it is to be said or done, divinely arises, Um, like being in a dance. So if we have our attention on self-appreciation, that would have our focus on ourselves. Given you mentioned being present is a combination of appreciation and the other of self-appreciation. How would you recommend practicing being present? Well, you know, I, I don't think that being present is necessarily about appreciation. You know, I, I see these as kind of related but distinct areas. You know, so being present doesn't have the, for me, it doesn't have that quality of I'm necessarily appreciating. I'm just bringing my attention. I'm attending to, you know, what is occurring. And in terms of uh, kind of a dyadic process, if I'm sitting with someone I don't know that I necessarily want to just be focusing on self appreciation, you know, because I, I think a lot, a lot of times that self appreciation can be done, you know, in yourself, you know, in the in the silence of your own mind and when you're when you're alone. But when you're sitting sitting with someone, you may indeed say, "I can appreciate myself," but not to not to get uh, totally caught into that the own uh, kind of window looking inward, because there's a relationship going on. And so how can you actually be present, you know, with the other person and attending to the other person and really like, to some degree giving to the other person? I think that one of the things that I find to be a great antidote to anxiety is giving. Right? I know that I've been in uh, numerous social situations where I kind of walked in and I was going like, how are people going to see me? Am I OK? Am I attractive? Am I smart? Am I desire, whatever, you know, have self-referencing, you know, happened to be occurring. And when I really shifted and I asked myself the question of, you know, how can I give or what can I give? Immediately, when I ask that question, my attention goes outward and I'm seeing other people and I'm being in a relationship and being when, you know, I think I mentioned Martin Buber last week and being an I and a thou, that there are other people out there, that they matter, you know, and so, I think that it's that continual opening up that really makes a difference in relationships. And a lot of times, you know, people get hurt. You know, uh, it, it could it not at all be the intention, you know, of the other person to be hurtful, but the impact was. And, you know, it becomes quite, a, quite an interesting dance about what to reveal, uh, if to reveal, what to reveal, 
how to reveal, when to reveal, you know, because it's it's inherently vulnerable. And to be able to do that in, in, in a self-responsible way, which is to not blame the other person for one's feelings, but to actually say, hey, you know, in your presence, like this came up for me. So I'm not quite sure what was going on. That's not exactly the intention of this particular talk and focus today, but all of these things in some ways get get wound together and what's part of what makes life so complex. All right, well, thank you for that. All right, Jane, Jane, the lovely Rose. Hi, thank you for a very provocative talk. I, I wanted to go back a little bit. It's been a long time, but I know in a therapy group way back, maybe 80s, I uh, heard a lot about secondary gain, but I don't hear very much about it now. I just wondered if you could say a few more words about that and maybe how that fits in with maybe some parts work that's a little bit more recent innovation, if there's any connection between these two things or what you might think about that. I, I was sort of uh, intrigued by some things going around in my head about those things. Well, I think a lot of times many of us don't realize that there's some, some way that our uh, self put downs help us to feel special in mm -hmm. some way. You know, that I'm the worst person or I am the least desirable person or I am the fill in the blank you know, person. And to some degree, that can be pretty, you know, it's obviously self-focused, but it's somehow making yourself special. You know, mm -hmm. and it could actually be a kind of hidden arrogance, you know, in there. I know that this may not be a popular statement because I'm sure a lot of folks here are, um, you know, pretty self-critical, but to actually see that there may be some way of elevating mm -hmm. oneself, you mm -hmm. know, in the process. Now, in terms of parts work, I mean, that would be a part of oneself, right? I mean, we, we have a multitude of different aspects. And so in the complexity of who we are as individual beings, that self put down, that self critic is one particular part. And it may indeed have been developed, you know, to make yourself on some level better than even other people, you know? And so again, I'm not saying that about anyone here in particular, obviously, but sometimes it's useful looking at what's the shadow side of this? What do I get out of this? What's the payoff to this? Yeah, and it may be, it may be you don't have to take certain risks. You know, like I'm so bad, I'm so stupid, I'm so wrong that I actually don't have to go out and you know breathe into the world my greatest aspirations because of course it won't work, right? Nor uh, do I have to change. I'm sorry, what? Nor do I have to change. Right, exactly. And that's a very important point because change itself can feel super threatening. You know, mm -hmm. like, and uncomfortable. <laughs> if, it's un if it's very threatening, it sure is uncomfortable. <laughs> I remember one of, one of my first supervisors uh, in psychology, this is over 40 years ago, uh, he said something to me, which I certainly haven't forgotten, which is he said, be it ever so shitty, there's no place, <laughs> be it ever so shitty, there's no place like home. Right, because it's familiar, familiar, family. And so stepping out of that comfort zone, and some of us go like, it's not comfortable. Well, yeah, it's not comfortable, but it's more comfortable than actually taking certain risks. Right. And I'm a I'm a strong believer in taking, I guess what I saw intelligent risks. I mean, I'm 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 not into like massive physical risk per se, but I think that. One of the most important ways of growing as a being is to risk, right? And risk rejection, you know, risk abandonment. And again, I'm not saying this to do it reflexively just for the heck of it. I am saying that in order to expand, you need to go out of your comfort zone. And, and I know as someone who has uh, gone out of my comfort zone many, many times in my life, and not that I always have, but you know, I have done a good amount of that interpersonally. I, I would, if I hadn't done that, there's no way that I would be who I am. And I'm not saying like, I'm, ex I'm, not, I'm not trying to exalt myself in saying that, but I know in comparison to the desperate, depressed, you know, semi-suicidal person I was decades ago, 
I mean, it's a long ways from there. And I think part of my words of encouragement to those of you who go like, I don't want to take risk or I've taken risk and it hasn't gone well. I just want to stay safe in my, in my particular place. I think it's perfectly fine to stay safe, you know, certainly at times. And if you really want to expand, you know, in life, you got to get out on the skinny branches sometimes. Again, I'm not saying taking stupid risks, but I am saying sometimes it really takes, you know, a willingness to speak up, really the courage to speak up about something. You know, I think it's really, really important. All right, so I think I have time for one more person. Thank you, Jane. Sarah. Hi, Daniel. Hey, Sarah. Thank you so much for today. I'm really enjoying the discussion and the meditation, and I'm very grateful for everyone here. Um, I, my question about relationships is when you can't do repair, when you, you alluded to this a little bit ago about when it's appropriate to like open up. And I find myself in a lot of situations where I don't see the benefit. I'm trying to like give compassion and I don't, I have to like kind of swallow it all. And I know that's like poison for me to not be able to discuss how I'm feeling about these things, but I don't find myself in situations where it's appropriate. And I'm just wondering how you deal with that and how you like, I, I try to offer the people compassion by, you know, like they're not able to like you know, right. handle things <laughs> at this point, right. but at the same time, and I'm trying to offer myself compassion because like, I'm not in the wrong. It takes two to tango, but like, yeah, it just, it feels like poison in bo the body. So I'm just wondering what your thoughts are that in relation to the themes you highlighted. Right. Well, that seems like a very small question as we come to completion. <laughs> um, wow. There's not a one size fits all you know, when it comes to this territory. I, I've i been someone who has been very much of an outlier uh, in terms of my willingness to, to speak up. I don't speak up as much as I used to. And I think sometimes people really need to find out, are you not speaking up because you're too scared or you're not trusting yourself? Or you're not You're not believing that you're going to be able to recover from this? You know, or you're not speaking up because it's actually the better thing to do. I, a lot of times I think people will will say it's the better thing to do because they don't want to take a risk. I'm not saying this about you in particular. I want to be clear about that. So I'm making a general statement. And then there's basically experience. Like if there's someone you try to have a mindful conversation with and every single time you did, the person just got super reactive and you're kind of like, well, what's really the point? And then I would ask the I would ask the question, what's the point of being in a relationship with this person? Right? Because you know, when you look at the vast number of people on this planet, you don't have to necessarily be now occasionally you you get trapped, you know, so to speak, in some type of relationship. Most of the time these days in the Western world, that's not the case. You know, and so I think I, I look at you know your sangha here. Like I've seen the chats. The, the level of love and generosity and support here is beautiful, absolutely beautiful. And those are the kind of people I would want to be hanging out with, you know, frankly. And, you know, depending on your work in the world, sometimes you have to face people who are, you know, of a different ilk you know, in a way. And it depends on your values and what's most important. And if it's really important to to get through that for whatever reason, whatever the vision is, whatever the underlying needs are, sometimes it calls for something more than you, you're necessarily wanting to give you know, at that time. So that's maybe a long-winded way of you know, talking about the complexity of it. Um, anyway, so thank you very much and thank you all for your attention and your intention. And I believe Rick, I call him Ricky boy sometimes because we are playful with each other, but uh, I'm pretty sure he'll be back next week. So thank you very much, and uh, I'll see you next time.